so that you can see who I am. Uh, my webcam, as you can see, it isn't working very well, it's flashing. So I just wanted to say hello everybody and welcome to this webinar. And, uh, and now I'm going to try... Uh, I can't see where I can switch this... Oh, there we go. I'm going to switch the webcam off again. Okay, so uh, Una uh, um, asked me to do this uh, DSpace installation. Um, I just want to mention before I start, uh, there have been attempts to uh, automate the installation using uh, various uh, Linux tools like Docker, Puppet, Chef, uh, etc. Uh, I had a brief discussion with Brom Layton from Admire about the automation of the installation and we both kind of agreed that uh, this is not really practical until we have one uh, working API for DSpace and one working user interface uh, because the installation becomes very complex because of the selection of what user interface you want to use and so forth. So I think my presentation is basically an installation of DSpace using the XML user interface. So um, let's begin. Okay, just to put this in context, uh, the understanding is that the institution has developed an open access policy. It has made an open access policy, uh, has approved the open access policy and has made it either a recommendation or mandatory for researchers to deposit their research articles upon acceptance of publication into their institutional repository. So, um, for example, organizations should have a data management policy uh, which is coordinated with the central IT department which will give priority to the data produced by the institution and how to archive it and what is the most important data to archive. Uh, for a research institution like Sunwash University, if we had a data management policy, an institutional data management policy, I'm sure that the uh, self-archiving and long-term preservation of our research outputs would be the number one uh, priority uh, for self-archiving and long-term preservation. That being said, I just want to continue to the next slide and to get into the actual installation. Uh, I would like to just make a mention of best practices. Um, before beginning the actual installation on a production server, I strongly recommend that you um, prepare and practice the installation on a development system or a test system uh, so that you're well aware of what uh, to expect when you do the production installation. My installation instructions apply what we call the best Unix system administration practice. Uh, it's a recommended practice, normally uh, from, from recommended practice for the uh, general Unix system administrator community and also generally recommended practice for um, Linux, Linux distributions based on Debian. Um, I try to obey the Debian developer guidelines when uh, installing DSpace, which says you never modify any of the software packaged by Debian. You never modify any of those files. The other best practice that I have adopted is that um, because this is uh, not software that is packaged by uh, Debian or Ubuntu for installation automatically. I've made use of the home folder as the location for the data and the code. Uh, it also helps having the home folder on a separate partition uh, for backups and uh, for um, writing scripts and uh, automating uh, daily tasks. Um, and then further on, the other best practice that I'm trying to um, promote is the use of a reference architecture so that uh, 
if you provide the reference architecture and you install according to my instructions, you have a much better chance of succeeding. These days can be installed on uh, a Microsoft server and other Linux servers like uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or um, CentOS or SUSE. My reference architecture is based on Ubuntu and specifically based on the Ubuntu, what we call the long term supported versions, which enables us to do planning for upgrades and installation. Uh, a long term supported version of Ubuntu comes out every two years. Uh, so, for example, next, next month, uh, 1604, long term version is released and will be supported for five years with uh, free security patches. And uh, at the moment, uh, I've standardized on all my, my, all my systems on Ubuntu 14.04, which has uh, free security support until 2019. The other best practice that I'm trying to implement uh, in the installation of, of uh, vSpace is to make the installation production optimized. In other words, we uh, try to optimize uh, Java parameters, we try to optimize the operation of the Tomcat Java web app server. I've removed the need for installing the Apache web server. It's an unnecessary overhead. I've also removed the need for the Java, uh, for the JDK, Apache JDK uh, connector to the Java Tomcat web server. That's also unnecessary. So, um, these best practices come from about 20 years experience using uh, first of all Linux and about 6 years experience installing DSpace systems. So I would like to go to the next slide. Ok, so let's begin. The requirements obviously for a successful installation is to have the right people to do the installation, to have the proper uh, network infrastructure for the installation then to have uh, the hardware required uh, the hardware can be virtual a cloud system or the hardware can be real uh, a real system a real piece of uh, what we call bare metal a piece of metal hardware and then ob obviously you need the software um, you need the uh, server operating software and you need the dspace software and all the required dependency software which i'll go through during the installation Okay, let me just go through the requirements for people. A person is required to install the software and maintain the server in the long term. This role is usually performed by the system administrator. Okay, so we need a, you can, it's advisable to have a system administrator. Uh, if you don't have one, perhaps you could uh, ask your central IT department to loan you one or another institution to, who has a Linux expert to help you with this. The other role that's also um, important is uh, someone to maintain the software on the server and that would be called a web programmer. For example, you would like to change the theme, you would like to uh, add another feature, you would like to help uh, fix bugs, etc. Uh, so it's also a good idea to have a web programmer. Again, you can employ the web programmer or you can um, hire the web programmer as a consultant. If you hire these people or if you uh, source these people as consultants, these people can also um, uh, help you develop and install other open systems. For example, if you would like to start open data, they could help you uh, set up an open data system. If you want to start uh, publishing your own journals, they could help you set up OJS. Um, if you would like to start open educational resources, a system of open educational resources using open source software, they can also help with that. Okay, just a little bit more detail about the network infrastructure required. Ideally you will have a 
institutional connection to some kind of research and education network. For example, in South Africa, we have a connection to uh, via Tenenet to the internet. Uh, I think, uh, and I speak on the correction, Stellenbosch University has a one, a 600 megabyte pipe, internet pipe, onto the uh, internet backbone. Also required on the institution, if, you, if you're going to host the server yourself at the institution, you need the institution to provide an internet DH, DH, DNS and DHCP services. This is normally provided by the central IT department, uh, the person or the persons in, uh, who manage the network on campus. Uh, those, are the, you know, those are the two core services you need uh, before you, you can host your own uh, institutional repository on, on campus. And number three, normally on campuses that have their own uh, institutional internet access, uh, they have a firewall between the campus and the internet. So uh, you will need to talk to the person who manages the firewall because uh, DSpace, uh, some of the plugins uh, and some of the functionality requires DSpace to talk to the internet in a transparent way and talk to the databases on the internet to, to grab information. So uh, you'll have to talk to the uh, firewall administrator on campus to allow the space to do that after your installation. Okay, that, that, those are the main points of the network infrastructure, the things that you uh, should keep note of and uh, as you prepare and plan for your installation. Another thing, um, very, very important when doing uh, the network uh, capacity uh, analysis is the name that you give, the internet name or what we call domain name or host name for your service. For example, at Stellenbosch University, we used um, Scholar as our branding, uh, Scholar, sorry, as our host name, and our full institutional internet name is Scholar dot sun dot ac dot za um, and as I mentioned here we try to avoid using the name of the software or the concept because these things uh, will probably not exist in five or ten years time uh, we might move to another type of softwares or um, the idea of a repository might evolve into something like the scholar archive so we try to avoid using any of those names or words when uh, defining the, the url or the domain name or the host name the second thing is yeah as i mentioned there in the second paragraph the software and our concept are only the vehicles and it should not define its url and also the when defining the name of the repository, what you want to give it the internet name is the, uh, what function will perform. Uh, if it's a cultural heritage archive, if it's going to be data management, if it's going to be a research outputs archive, that will help you decide what to call it. Uh, some, are, uh, what I've seen on the internet, some of them have been very creative. They've used local names for for example, archive, uh, they've used the local CSOI Lili name uh, to name their repository and they've given it that same name in the URL. Um, another very, very important thing uh, is for creating mindshare and for marketing on campus for your, for your repository or, and your, or your archive is to keep the, the, the host name or URL that you um, decide on as short as possible so that you, you can uh, that this becomes a memorable and easy to remember uh, a link that you can uh, easily uh, market to researchers and interested parties on campus. Another thing uh, when you look at the, the naming of the, the, your repository on the internet is to never change the name. When you start with the name, please don't change it because if you change the name, you'll be uh, causing a lot of uh, links that point to your project to be broken. So please, when you're doing the planning for your installation or for your repository, be very, take a lot of time and uh, 
an effort and think of a really good name and URL for your repository. I'm just going to type in the chat bar uh, which we, the URL which we eventually decided on. It took us a couple of months but it worked out very well for us and it has been branded now and basically if you ask any uh, student or researcher on our campus what is Sun Scholar and ask them to connect to Sun Scholar they very quickly will type in that URL uh, scholar.sun because the, it's, it's quite easy to remember it's, it's an memorable URL and it's a, it's a URL that uh, it's just, uh, easy to brand okay moving on right the hardware again as I said earlier on it could be uh, you could buy a, a real server or you can buy a cloud server and I just want to mention uh, we now run our, on our, our uh, repository on a DAO uh, server and we have a, a very nice punchy server with at least uh, we've got I think four, gig four terabytes of disk space we just upgraded our server so now we have four terabytes of disk space I think we have about 32 CPUs and we have about 64 gigabytes of RAM but we started off with um, a machine that had approximately what, one terabyte disk space that had approximately 12 gigabytes of RAM and 12 virtual CPUs this specification should give you a working fairly high performance repository for depending on the amount of content you upload for at least the next three years on average from an institution so Hopefully this gives you some kind of an idea when you're doing planning for your installation um, what kind of uh, hardware capacity you need. Right, on the software side obviously first item is you need uh, and we have standardized on Ubuntu as I said earlier on the Ubuntu LTS version gives us a, a planned window of support uh, the other distributions upgrade when they are ready and it's very difficult to plan so we stick with Ubuntu and also for South African patriotic reasons Ubuntu was developed or, uh, or founded by uh, Mark Shuttleworth so the first item is Ubuntu 14.04 uh, which I've standardized all our systems on then you need a Java development kit um, to be safe I have installed most of the Java components on our server so that there is um, that nothing is lacking then the next major component on the software side is the database and uh, we have standardized on the PostgreSQL days I realize that DSpace can also be installed uh, using an Oracle database but unfortunately um, it seems um, that Oracle is fairly expensive to maintain I um, this is uh, anecdotal evidence and please don't quote me I do not want to get into trouble with Oracle um, but we as a strategy we've tried to stay with open source software and Oracle unfortunately isn't strictly and purely open source so we've standardized on uh, the PostgreSQL database okay the next component of software obviously now uh, you have a Java application so you need a server that can present this application on the internet to users and that's normally the Tomcat uh, Java web app server in addition uh, you want to communicate with your users via email on the internet and with Ubuntu we standardized on uh, the Postfix mail server uh, in addition you might want to do some reporting and custom reporting and scripting for that uh, you, you, uh, also um, DSpace is very I'm sorry Ubuntu is very nice it comes with Perl installed uh, and so you get Perl as a, as a nice uh, as a freebie when you uh, use the Ubuntu server software okay the next software issue then for um, building DSpace, uh, it's very important to um, install or use the Maven um, 
I'm not a Java programmer, but I believe Maven does the uh, the compile of the Java components software, and then Ant does the uh, deployment of what they call the compiled WAR files into uh, deploys it to the Tomcat uh, Java web app server. So those are two very important uh, components as well. And uh, I've referenced the software versions on my reference architecture page on the wiki, which I assume will, you will find on my wiki. Okay, the installation basically involves three procedures, uh, which are, I've isolated to three procedures. It is a long installation process if it's done properly. There is a quick installation process, but it's not optimized. Uh, it would be difficult for you to optimize it for production purposes, and it will be difficult for you to uh, modify the code. If you standardize on the procedure that I have on the wiki and use the reference architecture, it will also be um, simple for you to create several systems and transfer, for example, scripts and code between them because now you've standardized the installation. Okay, so the three procedures uh, for the installation is firstly to install the server operating system. Once you have installed the server operating system correctly, then you need to install the required software to be able to build and compile and deploy the DSpace uh, Java web applications. And then finally, you install DSpace and configure it and compile and build. So I'm going to briefly go through um, the three procedures of uh, installing DSpace. Uh, we may later on uh, be able to provide a video of me actually doing an installation, uh, but we decided not to do it online because of bandwidth problems. So I will be recording an installation of DSpace 5.5 uh, and then um, Una and I myself will decide where we will deploy it on the internet and hopefully it will be a place where it will be fairly easily accessible, something like YouTube. Okay, so the first step of the installation is the server operating system. And as I said earlier on, uh, we have concentrated on the Ubuntu LTS version. When you're doing the Ubuntu server operating system, please take note of the host name and please have that ready and prepared before you do the installation. As I said earlier on, try to use a host name that is marketable, short, memorable, and that will be persistent and that you won't um, forget. Uh, it will be a name that you can easily mark and a name that you will not change because uh, you want to ma uh, um, maintain your link persistence. Mm -hmm. Then second of all, um, during the server installation, another thing to, to, to be very wary of is uh, to keep aware of, stay aware of, is the partition management. That's uh, how you slice up the disk uh, for the best availability and performance. There are some best practices um, which I have um, highlighted on my wiki. Um, then uh, the third thing, very important thing to remember during the uh, server operating system is to uh, create a DSpace user account in the home folder for that. Um, they are very important. It's everything lives in there. That's where your asset store will live. That's where the, the, the custom code or the, the, the and the web applications will live. And that is where the Tomcat web app server will look for the web applications. Okay. Then the second step uh, is preparing the server operating system and basically that means uh, installing a Java development kit, installing the Java web app server, uh, and, uh, installing a PostgreSQL server. Uh, also installing a Postfix server, installing the Maven Java compiler and installing the Ant Java deployment tool. Okay, then we carry on. 
So the last procedure is then actually installing DSpace software. So that basically follows this procedure. You get the DSpace software, unpack the DSpace software, and then configure the DSpace software. Uh, again, that's all well documented uh, on the wiki. And I will go through that when I do the demonstration installation. But these are things that you should take note of. I, I just want to go back here that the big thing to remember is that the installation in names you must go through these three procedures and once you complete them you will have a successful installation okay. so it's very difficult to automate this installation at the moment it's fairly complex but once the DSpace community has one user interface um, then it will be a lot simpler right on the installation of DSpace after the, um, the configuration then comes the compile and build of the DSpace software and it's deploying the um, the appropriate web applications to the Tomcat web app server and then testing your installation, testing the DSpace database connection and then testing um, the ability of the DSpace application to send email. Those are the very two important tests. But after installation, there are some very important tasks to do as soon as possible. Um, we call them daily admin or regular tasks. In other words, the tasks that the server will uh, do automatically to, uh, for example, uh, send out email updates, to update uh, indexes, um, to update uh, item counters, etc. There's a, there's a a long list of daily tasks that the, that the server must do. Then the second thing, as soon as you can after installation, is to um, enable a handle server, which gives you uh, persistent, uh, a persistent machine-readable uh, identifiers for each item on the, on the server. And then, for if you are integrating your um, DSpace with the local campus. Uh, what they call identity management system, for example, an LDAP system or a Microsoft Active Directory system, is to set up the secure login uh, so that you can secure your campus users' uh, usernames and passwords. Uh, so those are the three urgent post-installation tasks. Carrying on further, uh, not so urgent, is then to prepare a custom uh, copyright license, submission license, uh, which we have, uh, you can see on our repository. Uh, also is to we customize the email templates uh, so that the, at the bottom of all the emails sent that we have all the contact details of the repository team and how to contact them. Uh, so the footers of all the email templates have our contact details. And then uh, lastly, and uh, very importantly, um, if you're the system, matter, system administrator of the system, is to ensure that you have uh, backups and you have a, a proper working uh, disaster recovery system. Um, so we have two backup servers on campus and um, we back up to two different locations. In addition, we have a tape backup to a tape system to a disaster recovery room. So in the event of a serious disaster in the production system, I can guarantee recovery within at least 24 hours from one of the backup systems. And if one of the backup systems goes down in one of the buildings, we have another backup system running in another building. Okay. That brings me basically, uh, I think I've done gone through it very quickly. Uh, you know, I um, I do this very often, so it's very familiar to me. Um, if you want to see the uh, the whole procedure of uh, what we call practical guidelines for the deployment of DSpace, there is a an, a, an easy URL to use. I've used the, I've shortened the URL to that, and then for your, after the installation, if you would like to certify the repository according to um, international standards. Uh, I've 
created a wiki page for that and then here are my here's my email address and you're welcome to contact me um, for anything queries you have um, uh, I'm always available and I'll try my best to help you out um, so please just send me an email and I'll see what I can do and that um, basically only concludes the the thing there. If there's anything um, that anybody wants me to go into into greater detail um, without getting too technical, with, I try to keep this presentation non-technical and try to highlight the um, important planning and deployment, um, important planning and installation um, issues to be aware of uh, when uh, installing your own DSpace system. Thank you, Una. That's and I'm finished there. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Hilton. Uh, it was very useful. So as you've seen uh, in, in the text chat, we put some URLs uh, that uh, contain uh, very step-by-step -step detailed instructions. And uh, like Hilton said, we'll uh, record installation uh, procedure and share with you that recording link uh, sometime soon. We don't promise to do this today or this week, but we promise to do this as, as soon as possible. And please uh, type your questions if you have any. I think everybody's waiting for the installation video. <laughs> <laughs> Not today, I'm afraid. And I would also like to advertise uh, our next webinar. So it's going to be on Friday, April 15th, same time. And uh, it, we will talk about uh, essential post-installation tasks, how to make the DSpace repository your own. And uh, We'll talk about uh, daily administration, uh, optimization for search engines, uh, handle server, internet security, disaster recovery, then uh, research authorization and uh, identification, some more customization issues. So it will be the next step. And then we'll also plan um, webinars on how to upgrade this space because many of you already have your this space repository so if you want to upgrade yours uh, please attend them and our uh, tentative date for upgrading this space uh, webinar is april 20th same time and then uh, we'll have some more webinars about system administration and uh, customization but I'll send you all those details uh, in the email. Uh, so, Hilton, there are two questions. Other instructions on how to install on a Windows server? And uh, Jagadish is asking, is it possible to install in Windows server? It is possible. And I'll provide a URL to the space documentation which talks about this. Um. Okay, can I can I answer the, sure, the, yeah. the Windows Server installation? Mm -hmm. um, I realized that um, there are very few uh, Linux and Ubuntu skills out there. But we made a strategic decision at the beginning that we would stay with open source software, uh, number one, for security reasons, number two, for stability reasons, and number three, we stuck with Ubuntu, uh, again, for the long-term supported reasons. You can install on a Windows server, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I have not done an installation on a Windows server, so I do not have instructions for that. But you could use basically the same, it, it would tell, follow the same procedure basically, is install, install the operating system, which is the Windows server, then install all the, um, you prepare the server with all the softwares, it's basically the same idea, 
and then you do the DSpace installation. It's basically the same idea. Um, we are very happy using uh, Linux and we've had a very stable and secure system. Um, there's a question from Gaza. Thank you very much for the presentation. We have a question about the DSpace database structure, how well it looks like. Uh, I just want to mention um, there's been a, a great improvement uh, with the installation of DSpace when it comes to the database. The database structure is now automatically upgraded. There are no manual, uh, you do not have to run any manual commands now uh, to upgrade DSpace. But this is only available uh, with DSpace versions 5. Okay, there's a question from Tanzania. In addition, if we can have a session on configuring the uh, I can do that. Uh, we'll just please uh, send us an email later on so that I'll make a note of that, to make a special uh, note of how to enable that interface or configure that interface. And slides, okay. Uh, is there a question from the Technical University? No, the installation, uh, the presentation doesn't require any particular browser. Um, in my, um, when I do my um, demo installation, I'll be using a um, virtual box and I'll be running a, a virtual server inside the virtual box. So I'll try to use the screen casting or screen recording software available with um, Ubuntu. I haven't done it before and that's why I'd like Anna to give me a week or two to experiment with it until I can get the best possible video optimization and hopefully it'll be able to be uploaded to something like YouTube. Maybe the iPhone has a, a corporate YouTube account where they can upload. Uh, YouTube also is nice because then you can have a permanent link to the uh, upload. And then there's another one, got a yes, you can call it. Uh, okay, okay. All right, that concludes my answers, uh, Anna. Yeah, and about the recording, I was thinking maybe we can set up Google in the air and then uh, we can do live demo and uh, it will automatically go to YouTube, to iPod's YouTube account. But we'll, I'll discuss this with. Uh, our technical director and get in touch with you. And I think uh, configuring OAPMH is a topic for the next webinar yeah. uh, with Nathan. Okay. So it's uh, Friday uh, next week, same, same time when Nathan will talk how to configure OMP, uh, OA, how to enable OAPMH. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Gaza, the, is there any configuration steps to connect this space with Google Scholar? Yes, there are. Um, and I've got it documented again on the wiki. It's normally a post-installation task. It requires you to create normally a Google Webmaster account, um, tell Google that you have this account, uh, so you have this website, and send them the details of the tracking. There's also, you need to make sure that there's a, there's a whole we could spend a topic on optimizing DSpace for Google Scholar. Is the sitemaps uh, as well? You must have proper sitemaps. You must also make sure that you the, each item has the proper Google Scholar meta tags, etc. Um, but uh, it's on my wiki. I will. I will while um, later on, if I've got time, I'll try and post the link to that, that page on the wiki. I think it's um, also a topic for, for, for the next webinar, search, on, search, search engine uh, optimization. So Friday next week, uh, okay. Nathan was going to talk about All this. Right. All right, there's a good question from Kempala. Uh, which is better, XML or JSP user interface? That all depends on, on um, the expertise you have to support uh, the interface. Uh, the Java JSP interface requires a good Java program. Mm -hmm. The XML user interface requires a good Web 2 programmer, I like the XML user interface, it uses the latest web technologies. But with DSpace 6, um, and there's only going to be one interface, and um, hopefully that will allow us to take advantage of all the plugins available. So, for example, the 
uh, Chris plugin from I think it's Sinesia, the Italian service provider, is only available on the JSP user interface. So again, um, on the technical side, there's no, there used to be uh, performance trade-offs, but they're basically the same now. Um, so it, it depends on you really. There's another question from Belarus: Configuring Tomcat users. Wow, that's. Uh, <laughs> I have the. Uh, um, I think Erna posted up the optimization page. Uh, again, I have a, an optimization page on the wiki, which deals with what uh, optimizations I've made ena enabled on Tomcat for for what I call a production version of DSpace. Ah, uh, that's me finished there. Thanks, Erna. There is another question. Can this space work with other metadata formats? Yes. Um, previously, uh, DSpace 5, it can. Uh, you can uh, do, it comes up with different metadata form, um, um, uh, schemas. And when you're talking about formats, I'm assuming schemas. Um, you could do it with 4, but it wasn't well advertised. But with 5, DSpace 5, They've taken made a lot of effort to make sure that other metadata schemes can be used. Okay, from Kenya, can you administrate the DSpace server using Webmin? Yes, you can. Um, you can administrate the components of the server. For example, you can administrate the PostgreSQL server. You can administrate uh, if you're using Ubuntu. You can administrate the software installations um, I'm not sure you can administrate uh, the Java Tomcat web app server yet I don't know um, I haven't used Webmin on a server but I think theoretically if Webmin does Tomcat then yes it can be administrated uh, from Kenya in case of breakdown crash can the license be given again I'm not sure what that means, sorry. In Malawi, is it possible to integrate DSpace with an online control vocabulary? Called? Yes. Uh, there is a functionality functionality for control vocabularies in DSpace. I haven't enabled it yet, but I have a wiki page pointing to it. Uh, the problem with the enablement of online vocabularies is to get the online vocabulary, the subject vocabulary, into a file format that DSpace can recognize. Um, that requires a bit of uh, XML file manipulation. Okay, that's the questions over, I think, uh, you know. Yeah, let, let, let's see. Perhaps Sarah could clarify which license she meant. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to look for that optimization quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe if you could look and at that link. Okay. Okay, I'm going to post the link into the chat bar. But um, with the, um, the presentation, the next presentation, I would like to go into more detail of what optimizations we did for in the post installation uh, um, wiki. The next post, uh, sorry, the next post installation webinar, I will go through those optimizations. There is a question from Fred. Uh, Fred, can, can I, I do, do a mock installation as well? Yes. Most definitely, and I suggest practice as much as you can with that before you do the, the, the uh, production installation. The production installation of uh, uh, DSpace I've, I've documented on the wiki, the things to watch out for. So please read the uh, wiki bef before you do a mock installation so you can practice a production installation. Is it possible to migrate from Greenstone to DSpace? Theoretically, yes, I think I found some scripts that does the Greenstone export. 
D space is standardized on interoperable uh, export and import formats. So if Greenstone can export in one of those formats, theoretically it's, it's possible to import to DSpace. Okay, uh, Kapala, how can we secure our DSpace server from intruders? Um, not uh, it depends what you mean by intruders, but what we have done is we've enabled the uh, firewall utility on our Ubuntu server. So we only open uh, certain ports to certain uh, people. The other thing is we've limited the number of user accounts on the servers, so I monitor that. And also our, um, uh, we uh, have enabled secure connections to our DSpace server uh, using um, an SSL uh, security certificate. Um, Assuming question, there is no. So if that's what you mean by intruders from uh, from uh, hackers, and recently we've upgraded to DSpace five for that um, uh, sort of security breach in the code. So if you keep the code up to date, if you manage your user accounts, if you manage your firewall, you can have you can be fairly certain of protection from intruders. Um, And there's another one there. The current version of DSpace is 5.5. The next version will be uh, DSpace 6.0. Uh, from Tashkent, can we use DSpace as a system for capturing archive material? Yes. Um, all depends on how you, 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 you create the collection structure, sorry, the, the community and collection structure. It's quite capable of. Uh, DSpace can archive any digital object, uh, whether it be image, database, document, or audio. It can definitely archive, but it cannot. We are. It cannot stream audio and video at the moment, so there's no plugins for that. But it can definitely archive images and documentation. Yes, uh, Kosovo. It definitely can be used for catalog and oral history if you just update your um, DC schema to add a few oral history uh, metadata fields, very definitely. Okay, from Ghana about Active Directory. And I'm sorry, I haven't done an Active Directory integration, but I have done an LDAP integration. And I'll show you the LDAP integration, which might help you. And I'll just send you the link. Um, I call it researcher authorization and uh, just to abstract the idea and I'm just going to send you the link there so if you look at the LDAP and uh, you might get some hints on how to do the uh, active directory integration there is the LDAP integration which Linux OS is the most preferred per your experience to do that um, the, my most preferred obviously in, is Ubuntu but it's quite you can quite happily install on Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS what you'll probably find with your when you negotiate with your IT department is they would prefer you to use Red Hat because they can buy support from Red Hat I try to avoid Red Hat principally because upgrading a Red Hat system is a very complex dangerous process and I want to keep my Linux systems up to date for security reasons and upgrading an Ubuntu system is much much simpler than the Red Hats or the CentOS's or SUSE systems um, that is one of the very uh, big pluses of using Ubuntu it's, as the, the server operating system is much simpler to uh, upgrade than CentOS or Red Hat or anything like that uh, Vendor, is a problem if you use CentOS? Yes, if you try upgrades, good luck to you uh, Kenya, kindly elaborate on custom default submission license. Um, okay, I'll try and point you to the wiki page uh, and then you'll see it there. I'll, 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 uh, I'll go and look for it just now. There's another one, Kenya management. Is DSpace applicable to legal practices, IRA for storing case files, cause or issues? I'm not sure what that means, um, but I'm assuming if you just want to archive legal documentation, 
it is certainly a vehicle for archiving uh, documentation and how it applies to legal legal stuff I'm sorry um, I'm not sure about that David sorry okay I'm just gonna go and look for that uh, link about the default submission license so that you can have a look at it so in terms of uh, file formats this space can handle all kinds of file formats sir yeah, any any bit stream um, but you try to make sure that you use uh, file formats that are open that can be accessed by future researchers without having to uh, uh, install or use proprietary software because we're not sure in the future if there will be a Microsoft or an Oracle. So any file format, my recommendation, any file format as long as it's in an open format. Okay, where's that default license now? Are there any more questions? Okay, I found the link to the license page. I'm just going to put it up there now. It should be there, our, our example of our default license. And I will email you the chat with all those links, sir. So don't worry about copying all of them right now. I'll, I'll send you an email okay. with all those links. Uh, this one from Technical University, Benjamin. Talking of strength, what are some of the challenges observed from the DSpace that we should look into? Um, strength, what are the challenges observed? Um, I realize that some there are some uh, problems with institutions deploying and, and, and using this space because they lack the um, technical skills or operational skills. So to help those who are looking for alternatives, I um, started a page called the list of repository software and I'll post up this link and you can have a look and hopefully judge this space according to all the other softwares available. Uh, like I said, I haven't deployed all the other softwares, so I can't um, make a judgment of DSpace in relation to, say, Archive Matica, in relation to, uh, let's have a look, what are they, um, uh, to in relation to ePrints, in relation to BE Press, in relation to Illandora, Amica, Vero, ETD, but I've got all those lists there, and you're welcome to download, configure, and set up uh, a development system to see how DSpace compares to those. And it'd be great to have a community of practice of us to discuss the differences and the, the pros and cons, but um, with the uh, limited resources and the fact that DSpace is the most popularly used institutional repository software out there, we concentrated on DSpace, okay? Yeah, that was also our rationale because most of the repositories in Eiffel network have been set up using this space software. That's why we are running those series of webinars about this space. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I guess if there are no other questions, sir, you have Hilton's email in case uh, you will re remember that you've forgotten to ask him something. And then on Friday next week, April 15th, uh, we'll have uh, another webinar with Nathan and Hilton. And we actually have two more questions, <laughs> Hilton. Uh. David, uh, David how easy is customizing vSpace? It's not easy. Um, that is why I wrote up the wiki and I tried to document as much as I can um, uh, about customizing vSpace. Normally the customization is, th is uh, the big customization um, and it's the theme. So I have extensive documentation on the XML user interface using the Mirage uh, 1 theme and the Mirage 2 theme. But it is still a challenge to customize. It requires some technical skills. Uh, 
Connor, what is the minimum hardware requirement for DSpace? Um, that is on the DSpace documentation. If you look at the official DSpace documentation, the 5 .5, they actually have a little uh, a minimum hardware specification there. If you have a look at the official documentation. Uh, all right, project says. All right, thanks very much, Thomas. Thomas has also suggested to have a similar webinar in French language uh, for our French speaking uh, participants. Uh, and we're currently looking for <laughs> a speaker who would be as good as Hilton, because unfortunately Hilton <laughs> doesn't speak French. I can do Palais Vu Francais. I'm afraid it's not enough. That's <laughs> about all I got. So I hope to see you again on Friday next week, same time. Multi-language. I think it's also a topic for the next week. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, this space supports about eight languages, eight or ten languages out of the box. Um, yes, it does do multi-language. Nathan is going to speak about this uh, on Friday next week. If I, uh, uh, Thomas is talking about translating the wiki. Uh, I would like to speak uh, off the record. This is not official yet, but we are we are uh, making arrangements to talk to a major organisation in South Africa. Uh, to bring in interns to help us and I was hoping that one of the interns as a PhD project or a master's or an honors project would take up on s take up some work on this space for example of the tr a translation of, the, uh, of some of the stuff but we'll see how that goes and I can't officially comment on that Okay, that's me enough. I've uh, finished. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, <coughs> yeah, actually, we thanks for suggesting this, Benjamin. Uh, we've been talking that maybe we can set up something like, I don't know, a mailing list or where you can send some challenges or maybe uh, a, a wiki page or We have a list uh, at the moment called the R Talk mailing list, which I maintain. Um, so those of you who want to uh, uh, make inquiries of uh, the local, it's basically a lot of people um, from Africa have joined the list. Um, and I'm just posting the link to the list there now. So I suggest join the list and uh, post your questions on the list. Uh, and uh, I monitor the list and I will reply. And if you need uh, a special page or where you can register this, uh, maybe it could be just, I don't know, a shared Google Doc, <laughs> which we'll create for the purpose of those webinars uh, where you can write your feedback. Because I, I think that would be the easiest way to, to start if you want our immediate response. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, have uh, a very good weekend uh, see you uh, in a week and a half um, sorry that we haven't thought about our participants from Palestine for whom Friday is a day off I don't know would, would it be a big problem for you if uh, our next webinar is on Friday because maybe we can still change the date for It's okay. Okay, if it's okay, then we'll... Ah, Bukuriyo is...
Okay, let 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 us discuss then with our other presenter Nathan whether other day uh, would work for him because uh, I can see that for some people Friday is not very convenient. So I'll communicate all of this in an email. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'll follow up via email with everybody with slides recording uh, next webinar date or uh, Google Doc for questions and comments. Thank you. I'll be ending the session soon and I'll stop the recording.